リンクスタート Sword Art Online has been one of the most well known isekai anime ever since it popularized the genre way back in the long lost age of 2014. And over the years, people have developed differing opinions on it. Well, I'd agree with the fact that the show does have its own flaws, but let's be honest here. What story doesn't? Love it or hate it, Sword Art Online revolutionized the isekai genre, and because of that, it still fascinates me to this day. From a failed attempt at a contest submission in 2002 to one of the longest animated isekai shows, wow, that was sad to say, possibly the most fascinating thing to me, a writer about Sword Art Online, is the growth of Reki Kawahara as the series went on. As a writer, your characters will grow with you as you write. Each character you make will become part of yourself, and in turn, you will grow with them. Reki Kawahara is an amazing example of this, as the original Sword Art Online, or the Aincrad arc, had been a failed submission to a competition at the time due to it being far too long. Needless to say, it was filled with enough bad writing to make an anthology manga feel consistent. But where any other isekai anime would have just stopped airing due to the source material being just as stale or badly written, Sword Art Online received a season 2, a season 3, and a second part to that season 3. So, what sets SAO, seemingly the most generic of the generic isekai anime out there, apart from the rest? Well, to a lot of people, the answer is nothing. But, to me personally, it's the growth of the writer. Because as each season of SAO went on, you can see that Reki Kawahara learns with trial and error throughout each arc, and from the pretty decent Aincrad arc to the widely agreed upon to be terrible Fairy Dance arc, Kawahara has taken into account the things that he has done right and wrong in each arc, and now, with SAO Progressive and Unidor Ring in the writing and Alicization being fully animated, it's pretty easy to see how far he's come. So, what sets Alicization as a story apart from the rest of SAO? Well, Alicization incorporates the risk of Aincrad, the fantasy of Fairy Dance, and the mystery of Gun Gale, while simultaneously working out the flaws of each of those previous arcs. It was always a bit immersion breaking in Season 1 when Kirito seemingly got random powers that the system didn't intend to give him, or when the players in Alfheim acted like they were totally part of that fantasy world, which makes no sense considering it was only an RPG that they weren't even trapped in. And the biggest complaint from some people in the first couple of seasons was Kirito's seeming lack of concern towards putting on another virtual headset when the first one had trapped him for two years of his life in a game that could have easily gotten him killed. Kirito's PTSD was addressed slightly in the first couple of seasons, but not enough to the point where it caused major character development. He acts a little too into it in Fairy Dance, which was just the game, sure, and he does freak out that one time in GGO where he realizes that Death Gun was a former Laughing Coffin member. But none of these really changed him as a person or affected him in too great of a way in the end, as he always just came out on top, the invincible Jesus Kun. So, how does Alicization, the most recent season of SAO, resolve all these issues? Well, first off, Kirito doesn't enter the fantasy world of his own accord, but instead has to due to being stabbed on the way home and put into a coma. Though, to be fair, this has his own flaws too, like why the fuck does he give him permission to use him as a test in a simulation that he can't keep his memories of? He realizes that the people he meets are actually a part of that world and that they aren't aware of the outside world. Because of this, the risk of losing someone becomes, at times, even more real than that in Aincrad. Since in Aincrad, they couldn't feel pain and could just heal up or teleport away with a single item. But this world is very much reality, and the people could very much be injured or killed just like in real life. And as Kirito becomes attached to this world, so does he to the people of that world. And that's what drives him forward to save the world instead of just logging himself out. Which was another complaint from people watching Aincrad, where he kind of acted like a selfless hero for no reason. So, in a way, in Alicization, he became very much a part of the world that he's been dropped in, and he explores the world with his friends and makes friends and enemies along the way, instead of just being some solo player. But the best thing about this new world that Kirito has been dropped in is that it also offers him the very opportunity to use those powers that seemed to make no sense in earlier seasons the incarnation system. Which was hardly even a throwaway excuse in prior seasons for Kirito to enter what fans like to call God Mode, actually becomes an important part of the power scaling of Alicization, being the deciding factor in every single battle or event, and also both limiting and boosting Kirito at times as he was still inexperienced in using it. Every character has access to these powers, and those who can master their own mind would come out on top. Yeah, while it does just seem like a lame excuse to make the main character being overpowered a logically possible thing, 
at least it can now be explained instead of the friendship and bullshit logic of the previous seasons. And in case the whole Kirito doesn't show his PTSD enough argument was still around, Man literally spends an entire core in a wheelchair unable to do anything due to losing his best friend. You can't look at me with a straight face and tell me that he's not traumatized. And what sells his character development throughout the seasons even more, addressing a line from back in Alfheim where Kirito refused to let Leafa go off and get herself killed even though they didn't actually die in that game, this time, Kirito actually acts upon his thoughts, and instead of letting Alice get slashed like Asuna did in the ending to Aincrad, he jumps in front of her and blocks the blow, channeling his own personal trauma into the incarnation system, and maturing into a character who can protect those around him instead of just saying that he will. But of course, putting my fanboy side aside, not everything in Alice's station is perfect, and that's fine, no writer is able to write perfectly. Sure, there are still a few issues with why Kirito is still going around putting his brain into virtual reality machines, or why Leafa got... <laughs> Meaning the fault of the studio, I'd like to say. So, while SAO still isn't as beautiful as Mishoku Tensei or as tragic as ReZero, it has made just as big of a footprint in the genre of isekai due to how the story seemed to grow with the writer, and in turn, with us, the fans. Watching Cal Har's writing evolve over the years was probably one of the biggest factors that inspired me to start writing, as there was something reassuring to the idea that you didn't have to be perfect to write a good story. And trust me, I know all the counterpoints that you can make to my opinion. But, if nothing else, you willingly listened to it for the past 6 minutes, so it must have interested you in some way. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. My name is Sue, and I'll see you next time.